Hi, I'm Norman Jewison, the director, and as you know, every every movie or every film that uh, that we make has a number of scenes uh, that eventually end up on the cutting room floor. Um, sometimes I regret this. The director usually regrets it because we spent so much time and thought in making these scenes, but. In the last analysis, the structure of any film and the rhythm of it um, uh, is, is more important than any single part of it. So therefore, the whole film must be a theatrical experience for the audience. And in order for audiences not to get bored, because that's my greatest fear, is that the audience is going to tune out. In other words, not believe what is happening on the screen, because believability is what filmmaking is all about. If you believe what's happening on the screen is real uh, and believable, then you stay locked in to that film. If it's not, then you start looking at your watch and wondering where you're going to go to dinner that night, or has anybody got any popcorn, uh, or why am I here in the first place? Uh, you lose it. Uh, you wonder why the hell you even came. Um, so, I would like to introduce about four or five scenes in the hurricane uh, that were taken out, some of them at the last moment, uh, some of them um, a month before, some of them after the first cut, whatever. The first cut of this film was over three hours. The film that you've just seen Tonight is probably two hours and 24 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, without uh, credits. Um, I've only made one film over three hours that was um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, which had an intermission. So uh, I like to keep my films tight. Here is a scene that was taken out between Denzel Washington and the character called Mobuto. And this scene was in the film to show that Reuben Carter uh, had one great fear. That was being body searched, the humiliation of having to strip down. And that would, that would be necessary if he was going to meet Lesra. So he had to make this enormous compromise. He was worried about it, so he went to discuss it with his very, very close friend, Mobuto. Mr. Mobutu. Hey, Rue. Where you been hiding yourself, Mr. Hurricane? Traveling. I brought you some uh, spaghettios here. Yeah. Tomato and cheese, so. You could put it down there. Thank you. Come on in. How was it? Something's on your mind. Yeah, yeah. You get any visitors, Mr. Mabuto? <laughs> you here? <laughs> <laughs> not me from the outside. Uh, my daughter used to, but she don't come around no more. How do you deal with it? What? That search. You know, they got these new contact visits now, and you got to go strip search, and I... I never let nobody touch me. Can you still do it and retain your dignity? 
If you got a visitor, you go. It don't matter. The search don't matter. None of these fools in here can touch you. But your visitors, they can touch you. Yeah, that's what worries me. The next scene is 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 the group uh, uh, from the commune: Lisa, Terry, Sam, and Lesra. And this scene was in the film uh, simply to explain that after Reuben called and said he couldn't do the time anymore, and they felt that they had to really get involved, that it wasn't easy. Uh, these people were going to travel all the way from Toronto down to New Jersey. They knew what it would mean to commit themselves. Um, so this scene was written to show uh, this argument about whether we, should, we could help Reuben, uh, how easy, how difficult it would be, and so on, and what it would do to their lives. I didn't particularly like the, the writing in this scene as a director. I was having problems with it. And I felt perhaps it was too, too wordy and a little, perhaps uh, a little melodramatic. I don't know. It, it was not my favorite scene. I worked very hard on it to make it work, and the actors worked very hard and did some improvising. But there is one wonderful speech at the end of the scene given by Sam that I really wish was in the film. Watch this scene. We can't just drop everything. I don't get the point of this conversation. Neither do I. The man called us and said, I can't do the time. That's an all-out commitment to be free. He's reaching out to us, Terry. And I say we either match it with the same commitment or, or we're wait, honest wait enough with ourselves to be able to tell him that we're just a bunch of bullshitting liberal do-gooders and he can't depend upon do us. Do you have any idea what that sort of commitment means? We, can, we can't just squeeze Ruben's case into the weekend. Not squeezing it 24 exactly hours a day, point. seven days a week, Lisa. That's what it means. That Until he is out of that prison, that's what it means. And what's wrong with that? <laughs> we have bills to pay. We have a life here. We have responsibilities. We have a home renovation business. Exactly. Big deal. I mean, come on, Terry. We're always talking about doing something with our lives, you know, trying to make a difference. Well, I thought we were making a difference right here. I know, it's just... At the end of my life, I don't think I'm going to regret having missed an opportunity to renovate another home. But I do know one thing. If we walk away from this now, we'll regret it for the rest of our lives. Shit, man, now you talking. <laughs> Shoot. You know, in, in, in cutting a film, there are so many arguments with, uh, that the director goes through. Uh, you argue with your editor. You argue with your assistant editor. <laughs> you argue with your wife. Uh, you argue with the producers. You argue with the executive producers. You argue with the studio. Uh, all of these things affect uh, the final cut of a film. But in my case, uh, I really don't have any excuse uh, because um, uh, I have final cut in my contract. And uh, studios don't like that, of course, but, but <laughs> it means a great deal to me. And uh, personally, uh, I won't make a film if I don't have final cut. Uh, so uh, because, you know, um, filmmakers are, you know, very, very paranoid. And we were afraid of everybody changing the colors of our painting, so to speak. And uh, unless you have control over it, um, you know, we feel um, vulnerable. But here, we, here I am trying to apologize for, for scenes that I took out of the film, which now that I look at, I wish I'd left in. This is one very short scene that I wish I'd left in because it shows not only 
I felt it was redundant because they kept looking for this car that they felt was the wrong car the night of the murder and that, that this would be an important piece of evidence as you remember in the trial. The thing that I like about the scene is shows their frustration and the humanity of these three people wandering around New Jersey trying desperately to find the truth. Sorry, can't help you. Thanks. Well, maybe there's no such thing as a working 66 Dodge Polaro. I mean, no one even knows what the taillights look like. It's a 20-year-old junker we're talking about. Well, that's why we're in a junkyard. We've been down here, what, a year? Nobody remembers. Nobody cares. I mean, everyone we talk to still thinks he killed these people. So what are you talking about, quitting? I didn't say anything about quitting, Terry. That's in your mind. Oh, what do you mean by that? You mean you haven't wondered what the hell we're okay, doing here? Like you okay. haven't thought about okay, packing enough. up and going home? You know what? Maybe Friedman's right. Maybe it's too tough. Maybe we can't go the distance. Is that what you think? Let's just keep looking. These, uh, these cut scenes, uh, or additional scenes that uh, weren't in the original picture, we've tried to, to put them in, in order. And the next scene is 178, which was a scene where the police, the local police in Patterson, New Jersey, or Trenton, uh, provide a little bit of harassment for the uh, for Sam and Terry and Lisa and Lesra, who have taken up residence in uh, within sight of the Rahway Prison uh, in Rahway, New Jersey, and uh, I. I very reluctantly cut this scene at the last moment, simply, I think, because of length and because I felt that, uh, again, um, they were threatened by, uh, by Della Pesca, the detective, and the, their car had been tampered with and all of those things. But this is a scene that is described uh, by the Canadians in, in their book, uh, Lazarus and the Hurricane. Uh, it's a scene, uh, ostensibly, that really did take place. And, and this is our version of that moment when the police come uh, to give them a little bit of harassment uh, in New Jersey. Bradley's told how to testify. Bella's a shit-kicking son of a bitch. Says he suddenly doesn't remember. He doesn't remember. Get his key again? That's not Sam. It's the police. Can I help you? We had a complaint. What about? Just gonna look around a little. Who are you, people, anyway? What exactly are you doing? We're writing a book. A book? About what? About America, from a Canadian point of view. You sure as shit don't look Canadian to me. I sure as shit ain't. Then where the fuck are you from? Look, I'm not completely familiar with your procedures, officer, but I am familiar with the law. Now, we've invited you in, you've had a look around, so unless you have a search warrant, you're gonna have to talk to our lawyer. I don't give a fuck about the law. I don't want to see your faces around here again.
This is perhaps one of the most important scenes that was taken out of the film, which really did affect, I think, um, the the outcome of the film, simply because apparently the group of Canadians did find the name of the cab driver that drove the cab that evening from a member of the Carter family. They tracked this guy down where he was working in a warehouse. He claims that he heard the police report of the murder at the Lafayette bar, that three people have been shot, the police were on their way. Before he arrived at the night spot, where he got out of his cab, went into the night spot, and saw Reuben Carter there. Now, if this is true, therefore, it's impossible for Reuben and John Artis to have committed the crime. This man never gave any testimony. Uh, he had disappeared. He was frightened. Uh, he indicates there were certain pressures. you got to remember this, this case was taking place in the 60s, in the middle of the civil rights revolution in America, where there was tremendous fear uh, and pressure between black-white communities and between law enforcement officials and uh, the media and, uh, and ordinary African Americans in the street. So this kind of tension always prevailed behind this case. By leaving this scene in the film, it somehow proves beyond a doubt, even though the man never, if he's telling the truth, never appeared in court, but it took away from the tension. Because at the end of the film, even though we know that Reuben Carter is free today uh, through the federal judge and the Supreme Court ruling, it somehow took away from the suspense that the film actually builds uh, for the audience and keeps them keeps us waiting. Is the judge going to come down with a verdict of, 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 of non-guilt? You know, so, so this is why uh, we took the scene out. This scene, if it had been left in the film, probably would have stopped a lot of the, the controversy that arose around this film. Because whenever you do a film that deals with a real story, with a real event where the people are still living, or some of them, um, there is always controversy. And since this was perhaps one of the most celebrated trials to come out of the 60s, there was a lot of controversy. So here is the scene that was written between the, uh, between Sam and the cab driver whom they found some 66, 70, some 24 years later. So you ever drive for those guys part-time or anything? <laughs> no, don't drive cabs no more. Can't take them freaks like I used to. Yeah. <laughs> Too many crazies out there, you know. You remember seeing him that night? And that was a long time ago. But you knew who he was, right? Sure I did. Everybody did. Now, I was a big Hurricane Carter fan. Saw him fight Johnny Torres the year before. Mm -hmm. Man, what a punch. <laughs> what a left he had. <laughs> the time you uh, say you saw him was 2.30 in the morning? Man, I don't know what time it was. But didn't you tell the... Uh... I heard a call come over the police radio talking about three people got killed over on Lafayette Street. And then? Look here, man. I don't want no trouble. This here is a small town. I'm, uh, I'm not trying to make trouble for you, Mr. Gardner. It's just that Reuben Carter's been in prison for 19 years for something. I'm going to tell you this one time, then I'm never going to tell you again. And if you tell anyone, I'm going to say you was lying. Okay. I heard about the killings. That I'm a cab. Walked into the night spot. And I'm looking right at Hurricane Carter standing there in the crowd.
Mr. Gardner, what are you so afraid of? Man, already done told you. 